Welcome everyone. My name is Sabrina Paganoni and I'm so excited to be here today with all of you for our weekly webinar series. Uh, I see that people are joining the webinar and as always we see familiar names on the attendee list as well as new people. So thank you to those of you who are following us on a weekly basis uh, and welcome to everyone else who might be new. And um, as you may know, these webinars get recorded and posted on our website. You can also download the slides. Um, so thank you for again for following us every week. Uh, next slide. Today for our um, weekly webinar, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, a uh, phenomenal colleague from Duke University, uh, Rick. Thank you, Sabrina. It's great to be with you, everyone. Could I have the next slide, please? I thought I would just tell you a little bit about myself and, and my career. Some of you may have heard some of this before, but I saw my first patient with ALS when I was still a resident that was almost 25 years ago, believe it or not. And I remember thinking it was the most amazing story and the most unbelievable collection of exam findings I'd seen up to that point. And I remember just how bad I felt when the attending that I was working with swooped in and said, we know what to call this, but we really don't know why it happens and there's really nothing we can do about it. You just have to go home and get your affairs in order. And I remember driving home that day and thinking there had to be a better way. And so when I Graduated from my residency, I did a neuromuscular fellowship to learn more about this disease. And then I started building a clinical program here. I built uh, the Duke ALS clinic team, which now consists of 17 providers across nine different disciplines. And when people uh, with this disease come to see us at Duke now, they're going over by this whole team. Everyone on the team has one specific body part that they focus on. And if we see that ALS is trying to take something away from that body part, we're trained to offer evidence and experience-based options for compensating. And so now people leave here with a long list of things they can do to live a better life and a longer life. And I also thought it was important for us to incorporate research into our program. And so the first type of research that we started doing was being a site for other people's trials. And we still do that. <clears throat> We're still a site for a lot of multi-center clinical trials um, I think one of the reasons we get invited so often is that our clinic has grown so much. We now follow about 450 patients with ALS. In recent years, we've started to do what I call investigator initiated trials, things that I came up with and that we're only doing at our site. And I'm very excited about some of these. We, we did one of a drug called levetiracetam a few years ago. We did one of a, a nutritional supplement that was associated with an ALS reversal called Lunacin. We did one of a concentrated form of coconut oil that came out of an ALS Untangled review called Triheptanoin. And uh, we have one going on right now of something called Theracurmin, and we just finished one of a drug called Clenbuterol. I've also been able to get involved with some translational work. One of the reasons I came to Duke in the first place is there's so many smart people here, so many great labs. And I'm, I'm just so pleased that I've been able to build bridges between those labs and my clinic. And um, we've got something going on here called the STAR program, the study of ALS reversals. Lots of folks here helping me to try to understand why some people with ALS appear to recover and how we can make that happen more often. And then we've also got a program here called Neurophoresis, which is a filter that one of my neurosurgery colleagues developed. He actually built it to filter blood, but I think it might be useful for people with ALS there seems to be something wrong with the spinal fluid of people with ALS. If we take that spinal fluid and we put it on cells of the immune system in a dish, it seems to turn them on, make them angry. And if we take that spinal fluid and we put it into the spinal fluid of a mouse, the mouse gets a disease that looks something like ALS. And so we've started some proof of concept experiments to see if we can filter whatever's in there with this machine and make it less toxic. I've also gotten involved in education and advocacy. <clears throat> and I did this because I wanted people with ALS to have more control over what's happening to them. I didn't want them just to be subjects in experiments. I wanted to be part of the design of studies and to understand and make more informed decisions about some of the products that were out there. So I created ALS Untangled, which is a way to, um, to link people all over the world to write reviews on some of the things that are claimed on the internet to be useful for ALS. 
I started the ALS Clinical Research Learning Institute to train people to really understand better. And then with the help of, with Allison and uh, Nadia, put together something called the Peace Committee, where we take all the folks who graduated from an ALS Clinical Research Learning Institute, people that we call research ambassadors, and we link them with stakeholders all over the ALS space who want patient input into their projects. And I'm happy to say that's happening so often now that we might have to increase the frequency of our meetings from once a month. We, we seem to have more people that wanna network with research ambassadors than we have time. Next slide. So my roles in the Healy ALS platform trial, well, I'm a site investigator and uh, Duke has been open and enrolling well. I'm also a site leader for the Verdiperstat expanded access program. And I've been charged with putting together educational materials about expanded access that can be used by other neurology physicians. And the reason this is so important is a few years ago, I did a survey and the main people that answered my survey were, were people that took care of patients with ALS, neurologists, neuromuscular neurologists. And the results of the survey, it was pretty clear that there's a huge knowledge gap that most people um, who are taking care of folks with ALS don't know much about expanded access. And so we've got to figure out a way to get them more educated, more comfortable, to make it easier for them to offer at their site. And so we're gonna put together some written materials. We're almost done with a book chapter that uh, shows people how to do expanded access as well as right to try and experimentation with alternative and off-label treatments. We're gonna to put together a map and some specific templates that take uh, clinicians through each step. And the good news is that some of this already exists. We just have to modify it. So I showed you a screenshot there that's out there um, from the NIH that we're gonna borrow for our uh, NEALS expanded access training. And I'm also gonna put together a training course. So we've got some time scheduled at the upcoming NEALS meeting where I'm gonna take people through step-by-step step how to do expanded access at their site and answer questions. Next slide. And you know, I'm, I'm so excited to be part of the platform trial because it's really consistent with a mission that I've had from the beginning, a mission that has been recently named Drugs in Bodies by our brilliant colleagues over at um, IMALS. I've always thought that every person with ALS should have access to experimental therapies. Why? Well, almost every patient I've seen, and I've seen more than 3,000 now in 21 years of running the Duke ALS clinic, they want access to these things. And as a scientist who wants better treatment, why wouldn't I want every person to be experimenting with something? This could be something which is called high throughput screening in people. You know, we do high throughput screening in the lab. We develop a target that we think is important for a disease like ALS. And then we have a way to put that into a computer and squirt every FDA approved drug that we know of that works for other diseases into that machine to see which ones work on that target. And we do this in animals like ALS TDI does high throughput screening in different animal models of ALS, but we don't do it in people. We only get a small fraction of people with ALS on experimental protocols. And so how do we do this more? Well, clinical trials. I mean, the good news is we've got more trials than we've ever had before. And it looks like we'll have even more in the next few years. Expanded access programs like the one in the Healy platform trial. And then finally, there's a whole bunch of products out there for people that don't qualify for trials or expanded access programs, which I call alternative and off-label therapies. And so for those folks who can't find a trial or an EAP, ALS Untangled can help people to find products that might be promising. And I'm even developing something now called a personal experience tool with my colleagues at Patients Like Me. Because you know one of the nice things about trials and one of the nice things about the Healy Platform Trial Expanded Access Program is we will learn whether the drugs in those programs do anything bad or anything good for people. But the results of a lot of these individual self-experiments with AOTs, they're often lost. You know, I mean, they're not really, there's no place where they're documented. No one's really paying attention to them. And so what if somebody somewhere found a regimen that actually worked for ALS? We might not know about it. And so this tool, I think, can help us to get more information about what's happening in all these thousands of N of one experiments. And the way this works is 
patients like me has a huge amount of longitudinal data on people with ALS. There's more than 10,000 patients with ALS who've been putting data into patients like me, many, many of them for years. And we can use that data to generate historical controls. So we can figure out how a person with ALS that wants to try an AOT has been progressing so far. And we can use patients like me to find three other patients who are in that database who are progressing at the same rate. And we can generate these curves, these gray bars for how we expect this person to progress over time. And then we can ask them to put their data in on the regimen that they've chosen. And we can see if they're doing much better than expected, that might actually be an alternative or off-label treatment that we want to take into a clinical trial. So I'm, I'm very excited to be with you tonight. I mean, I, I often say I feel incredibly blessed to be able to get up every day, work on a disease that I still find incredibly fascinating, work with people like all of you on this call that inspire me, and work on it in my own sort of unique, outside the box, creative ways. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and the, the same is true for us. I mean, it's great to be working with you. We're really excited that you're part of the platform trial uh, at Duke. And, and most importantly, we are really excited to be partnering with you on Expanded Access, um, you know, the Expanded Access Companion to the platform trial, as well as other uh, opportunities really to, to do what you, you just described, to really bring, um, you know, um, experimental treatments to everyone with ALS who wants to have access in one way or another. Just before we take questions, I just wanted to, as promised and requested by the, um, the, uh, by our patients, uh, we always want to share the updated um, uh, enrollment numbers. So as you know, in this trial, we're testing four drugs at this time, uh, Zelucoplan, Verdiperstat, CNMAU8, and Predopidin, but we're working on adding another drug um, very soon and more drugs are under evaluation for 2022. So again, the idea is to, uh, to do something like you, you refer to that as a high throughput screening. So again, this is for a trial, for a, for a clinical trial. We're trying to test as many drugs as possible, as quickly as possible. And, and just moving to the next slide, uh, I can share this week's enrollment numbers. Every week, we want to update the community. Uh, the goal for every regimen, so for every drug, we want to enroll 160 individuals with ALS. So if you just focus on the bottom half of the slide, you can see that for regimens A, B, and C, which are the first ones that were started in last summer, uh, we're almost there. We're almost at enrollment goals for those regimens, which is fantastic. So thank you so much. So many of you on the, on the call did a participate in the trials uh, here or uh, have, have helped us really connect with patients uh, who want to, to participate. Um, and the, the last regimen, regimen D, started in January. That's, that's the only reason why it's a little bit behind in terms of numbers. But again, we, uh, we continue to work on enrolling all these regimens so that then next year we have the results of all these four regimens and then we will add more as I just stated. So let's go to the next slide. Quick reminder again to um, to email or call Catherine and Allison. Thank you for being on the call today, uh, Catherine and Allison. Uh, those are your um, contact information. And as you can see, this week we added QR codes to our slides, uh, which I must admit uh, I barely know how to use them. But Catherine can show you how if you call her. Uh, I think everyone, many people now are familiar with this, so it should be possible to use your cell phone as you're watching this webinar, or if you download the slides to be taken directly to some of the links that we have on the slides and we will continue to generate new QR codes so that it's easier to to get to the links that we share on these webinars. Next slide. Uh, and, and just to conclude, uh, again, please um, use the QR code to, uh, to register for future webinars. And this is the list of, of upcoming guest speakers. We have more that we are scheduling. Uh, again, we will continue to have this tour um, around the country, getting to know our sites. Uh, and, and then in the fall, we'll have the biostatistics series that uh, we discussed in previous webinars. So I think we can stop sharing the slides and take the questions. Uh, not surprisingly, we have lots of great questions for our guest speaker. Obviously, Grace, you're such a fantastic speaker. I'm sure we will want you back again as a guest speaker multiple times. So let's take the questions uh, for now. Um, have you noticed an increase in the incidence of sporadic ALS in the past 20 or 30 years? Hmm. Um, it would be hard for me to notice that I mean, it, to me, it feels like it's getting more common because I have so many more referrals. 
you know, I keep adding people to my team and in spite of more access than we've ever had, our wait times are getting longer. But I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that has to do with incidents versus um, there's just a lot more recognition of, of where some of the top sites are as far as resources. So I think, I think there's people coming from further away than ever before. Like it's only in the past maybe five years that we've started to take a lot of international referrals at our site. So I, I don't know whether it's an increased incidence or whether it's, it's just you know, a, a much better, a much tighter network of people with ALS around the world that are sharing information about maybe where there are more resources, where there's more exciting opportunities. I will say, you know, Brian Trainer published a paper a few years back that said the incidence of ALS is going to markedly increase over the next several decades. And the reason is the number one risk factor for ALS is age. <clears throat> so as the population of the world ages, there's going to be a much larger number of people getting diagnosed with ALS. Great. Yeah, there's a few questions um, specifically for you since you're here and you're an expert on this topic. How many confirmed reversals have you found um, so far? Uh, and also there's a specific question about one of your projects. Do, do we know when the genomics part of the STAR program will be released? Yeah. So as of today, we have 53 confirmed ALS reversals. Got a small stack of other ones on my desk that are promising but not fully confirmed yet. Um, so, you know, when somebody uh, reaches out to me and, and reports an ALS reversal, there's quite a bit of work to do to, to meet my definition. I've got to have sufficient medical records on this person uh, in English so that I can read them. And there's got to be enough in there for me to be convinced that they have ALS. So they've got to have the right story documented, the right exam findings documented. They've got to have a reasonable set of testing for ALS mimics. There's got to be enough in the notes for me to convince, to be convinced that this person progressed to where they were disabled from the disease. And then there's got to be in the notes objective evidence that they recovered lost motor function. So I don't count an ALS reversal as someone who's in a chat room who says, I had ALS and I'm better. You've got to meet that high bar to be in my program. So it, it sometimes takes me months to get everything that I need to confirm an ALS reversal. But we're at 53 as of today. And there's a ton of projects that are underway to try to understand these better. One of them is whole genome sequencing, and that is done in collaboration with the CREATE Consortium at the University of Miami and also at the St. Jude Hospital. And um, I, I don't have, unfortunately, a specific day when I know I'll have those results. Um, we did get delayed by the pandemic, like, like a lot of people that were doing basic research did. A lot of labs were closed. Everything was moving much slower. A lot of people couldn't go into work because their institutions wouldn't allow them. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have results by the end of the year, but I've done everything that I can do on my end to get those results out. I have to wait now for the people that are doing the extractions, doing the actual genetic testing and comparing the results to all the other people with more typically progressive ALS in the CREATE database. That's great. And there's a couple of related questions about the reversals. Um, so great question. Um, what, what do these 53 reversals have in common? And also another question, uh, where can people find information about reversals? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the million dollar question, Sabrina, that keeps me up at night is what is going on? What, is, what do these people have in common that allowed them to beat this disease? Um, about the only thing I can say right now is that most of them seem to be very positive people. And um, I don't know if that's something that was there before their ALS, or that's something that came out of the fact that, you know, they were told they had this disease, which is usually disabling and life shortening, and instead they got better. That would probably change your attitude for the better if that happened. But I mean, I'm studying them in every way I can. I'm studying, you know, all the different treatments that they took. I'm studying, as I said, their genetics with ALS TDI. We're looking at RNA and protein biomarkers with the Duke Microbiome Center. We're looking at the gut microbiome in these people and comparing it to folks with more typically progressive ALS, including people with very different progression rates, slow and fast progressors. We're looking at the environmental exposures in these folks. We're talking about maybe getting some induced pluripotential stem cells from these folks so we can start more like some of the electrophysiology 
So we're, we're studying them in every way that I can think of. But as of right now, I have not found the thing that they all have in common. Yeah. There's a few questions, I'll group them together. Essentially, they're asking, in your opinion, what are the most promising treatments being investigated today and what are the best uh, supplements or off-label treatments and how to find them? Yeah, the most promising things are the ones in trials. I mean, that's, that's why there's so much money and time being invested into those products, including the, the products in the platform trial. They're incredibly exciting. So, I mean, anything that gets into a legitimate clinical trial has you know, met a certain level of excitement. And those are the things that I try to steer my patients toward first. Uh, and, and part of it's the excitement of those products, but part of it is also, there's so much oversight in clinical trials that protects patient safety, you know, FDA, IRB, DSMB oversight. There's uh, very rigid protocols for gathering data. So whatever the result of the trial is, whether the drug worked or it didn't work, it moves the field forward. Yep. So that's why I always you know, say we should go for trials first. Next is expanded access, especially the kind of intermediate or large size expanded access that Healy's doing because you're using the same products, exciting products that are in trials. And also because you have some oversight and because you are doing standardized data gathering, we're going to learn things from these expanded access programs. And then finally, there's a lot of what I call alternative and off-label therapies. These include supplements, you know, like vitamins and things that you can just buy without a prescription because they're generally regarded as safe. It also includes products that are used to treat other diseases, maybe in the United States, but maybe even in other countries. And I think some of those are very exciting. So in that category, I would say I'm most excited about a product called Theracurmin, which is a water soluble form of curcumin that gets absorbed into, into the blood and probably the brain. And, and there it can be an anti-inflammatory, it can be an antioxidant, it can interfere with protein aggregation. Curcumin has also been shown in animal models to alter the gut microbiome. Um, so I think all those are exciting mechanisms. There have been, not the best designed, but there have been clinical trials of curcumin products in other countries that showed benefits for people with ALS. And there are nine ALS reversals associated with some form of curcumin. There's no other supplement with more ALS reversals than curcumin. So all this is why I've put so much money and time into a Theracurmin trial that's underway here at Duke University. An off-label product I'm excited about right now is called Clenbuterol. I'll be talking about that this weekend. Um, uh, University of Kansas has an ALS patient symposium this weekend, and I've got some very exciting preliminary results Clenbuterol is a beta agonist. It's in the same class as albuterol. It's used to treat asthma in lots of other countries around the world. It's not approved by the FDA for anything, but Americans may have heard of it if you're sports fans because many high profile athletes have been suspended from their sport for testing positive for quote unquote clen, as they call it. Why do athletes take it? Well, one of the side effects of it is it actually makes muscles get bigger and stronger in some folks. That's great in sports. It's also would, would be something great for people with ALS. And so I wasn't the first person to think of studying this drug in ALS. Uh, 15 years ago in Italy, someone gave it to the SOD1 mouse model and showed that it improved strength and prolonged survival. And shortly after that, an Italian investigator gave it to 16 of his patients in his clinic, didn't have any kind of control group, but 14 out of 16 people seemed to tolerate the doses he used real well and at the end of six months of treatment, on average, strength in the arms and legs was increased for the whole group. And FBC, force vital capacity, a breathing measurement, was significantly increased for the group as a whole. I don't know of too many products who've ever had preliminary data like that. Now, again, that's uncontrolled. It's not blinded. A lot of problems with it. But we decided to move forward with a, a slightly more scientific study. So we, uh, we finished earlier this year a 25-person study where each patient was his or her own control. So we looked at how they were progressing on the ALS, FRS, and the FBC coming in, and we treated them with pretty high dose clenbuterol for six months. The bad news is we probably used too high of a dose. We chose a higher dose because I have some colleagues here at Duke that have used this medication in pediatric patients with muscular dystrophy, and kids seem to tolerate higher doses just fine but we had actually 14 of our 25 
patients drop out before the end of our six months. But for those that stayed in, it was a pretty significant slowing, about a 70% slowing in the ALS FRSR progression. And, and that held up with the intention to treat analysis where we considered everybody, whether they dropped out or not, as long as they had two data points that allowed us to calculate a slope. In fact, when we looked at the um, change in the FVC on the intention to treat analysis, there was about a 90% slowing on clenbuterol. So I think it's very promising. Several of my patients now are importing that from other countries. I hope I can convince someone to put this into something like the Healy platform trial so we can do a more scientifically rigorous study. The problem is resources. You know, the study that I did, that was about $200,000. And that money was given to me by one patient. They said, what are you excited about? I said, clenbuterol, how much would it cost? 200,000, here's a check, did the study. To take it now into the next level, something like the platform trial, we're probably talking 12 to $15 million. So that's a big jump in funding. I don't have any patients that could just write a check for that amount. And you know, nobody really uh, is excited about owning clenbuterol. It's a generic drug in just about every country. So we're gonna have a hard time finding a company that's gonna wanna sponsor that. So because you are such a great speaker today, we have an enormous amount of questions like they keep coming in. So we'll try to take them and, and, and if we cannot get to them, we'll try to answer after the webinar. Uh, maybe I'll take a couple of technical questions about the platform trial. And in the meantime, Rick, I'll ask you if you can write down the name of the products. People asked if you can write down the name of the products uh, and the Italian investigators or you know other information about clenbuterol, if you could do that yeah. in the uh, chat. Uh, send and in the, to, send this to you? Uh, yeah, all, all, if you can do to all panelists and attendees, everyone can see it, can see the name pop up in the chat. And then while you do that, I just wanted to take a few quick questions uh, about the trial. Somebody asked about the open label of cinnamon A8. Uh, you are correct, the dose is uh, randomized to either a lower dose or higher dose, uh, and it's blinded. So we're gonna learn about both dosages as part of the trial, uh, which I think is really great. I also want to share uh, a message that somebody wrote about letting the community know that the expanded access bill is now up to over 300 co-sponsors um, and, and the, the sponsors have more than enough to pass in the house. That's that's the message that was just shared. So this is obviously great news. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll really hear more about this in the future. Um, quick question for you, Rick, is, is Duke part of the Biogen to first and expanded access or maybe can you, can you explain the expanded access uh, related to that? Yeah, and un unfortunately we're not part of that. So um, I would have loved to participate. We do have a handful of people with SOD1 mutations that we follow, but you know, I think, I think one of the things a lot of folks don't understand is how challenging expanded access programs are to get off the ground. Um, it's something that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try to address some of those barriers in the educational materials, but you know, not only is there quite a bit of work to do to try to find um, the different approvals that you need, the paperwork that you need to fill out, you gotta find clinic space, you gotta find somebody that can do the intrathecal injections, which I've never done. And you know, all these people want to be paid for their time, which is totally understandable. And there's no budget with that. So it wasn't, it wasn't one that I could figure out how to get off the ground at Duke. I think the most likely place something like that will get off the ground is a, is a site where they're actually already doing it as part of the clinical trial. So they already have a space. They already have people that are proficient in these intrathecal injections. So you know, the um, amount of momentum that you need to add the expanded access both physical and financial is not nearly as great as it would be if you were starting from scratch. Right. Uh, there's a few questions about other supplements. Um, uh, one question is about NAD or uh, nicotinamide. Um, there's some science uh, around it because of its role on mitochondria and neuroinflammation. So I wanted to know, the, the person was asking, um, asked whether you know you have seen a reversal, apparently you have seen a reversal that was attributed to that via intravenous infusion. Do you think this would be a viable um, clinical mechanism? Yeah, I mean, it's got a theoretical mechanism, as you've pointed out. Um, I believe NAD is also part of a product out there, which is called BASIS, which does have a clinical trial behind it. So BASIS, I believe, is a combination of NAD and something called pterostilbene, which is an antioxidant that's found in blueberries. And you know, BASIS has a clinical trial. It's 
it's uh, got a lot of methodological flaws, which make it difficult to interpret, but it is a positive clinical trial. My understanding is the company that owns Basis now has another clinical trial underway, which hopefully will be more solid from a method standpoint so that it's more interpretable. But, but I do think you know that's one that has a plausible mechanism and has at least some clinical trial data behind it. Yeah. There's two, it's kind of the opposite question. One person only has lower motor neuron problems and another person has only upper motor neuron problems. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll put the two questions together. Uh, do you know um, if um, you know that there are specific drugs that can help only the lower motor neurons or only the upper motor neurons? Um, and you know what, what would be the process? Because sometimes people can be excluded from trials if they only have one type of motor neuron affected. Yeah. Great question. So I believe that uh, these are all the same disease. I believe that this is a big spectrum, ALS, and that there's people way on one side who have almost entirely lower motor neuron signs and no upper motor neuron signs. And there's people on the other end that are the opposite. They have almost all upper motor neuron sign. What's my evidence that this is all one disease? Because if you follow people long enough and carefully enough, you almost always find the other type of motor neuron involved. So for example, the people with, with only evidence of lower motor neuron signs in life, most of them at autopsy have upper motor neuron involvement. So they really should have been called ALS instead of progressive muscular atrophy. And the people with PLS, if you follow them long enough and carefully enough, you keep doing EMGs on them, you almost always find something abnormal developing. It may be very, very subtle, but you find it. And so I, I, I believe all these folks should be included in our clinical trials. It's just you know, it's, there's sort of dueling ideas now about how to do clinical trials. I mean, I want to see them be as inclusive as possible, but from a scientific standpoint, and there's more and more evidence that we really need to be careful about that. Like maybe there's a subset of patients that are most likely to show a signal in a clinical trial. And if we take people that have had the disease for longer or are progressing more slowly, we may lose the ability to see that signal. So maybe the ideal solution is, you know, do a big trial, but you know, have like pre-planned subgroup analyses. You know, the, the group that you think is most likely to show a benefit, the early fast progressors, and then have all these other groups to say, is there any evidence of any signal or at least a safety signal to allow us to have confidence using the drug in everyone? So there's a few people who are asking about access to supplements, uh, somebody from a different country, uh, other people who have friends in different countries. And so specifically, they want to know how can they access clenbuterol, for example, or do you recommend that people, I guess, do that um, through international channels? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. I can't really recommend any specific therapy for anyone unless, unless I'm their doctor. But I mean, I can tell you, you know, with my patients, I'll, I'll do my best to educate them or, or learn about, if I don't, if I've never heard of it, any treatment that they bring up in clinic. And, you know, if, if clenbuterol is something that they're interested in from the data that I've shared, then I try to help them import it from another country. So you can't get a prescription and take it to a pharmacy in the United States and get clenbuterol. It doesn't exist. It's never FDA approved for anything, but there is a legal way to bring it into this country through something called the FDA's personal importation policy. That's a policy that allows people with a serious illness like ALS to bring a drug that's approved in another country, but not your country, legally in for your own personal use. So you can't bring in a whole bunch of this and, and start selling it out of the back of your car, but you can bring it in for your own personal use. And you know what you need is you need a letter from your doctor, you need a prescription, and then you need someone to help you find a source and get it through customs. And so you know, that part of it can be tricky. And I have for years used a uh, online group called the Social Med Work. So this is the entire business model of the Social Med Work. They help people find drugs approved in other countries, but not theirs that they want to legally import. And this is what they request is a prescription, a letter from your doctor. And then they, they request, I believe it's six months worth of money for the drug up front because I think it's a quite a bit of work to bring it in. So they don't want to bring it in in small quantities. Yeah. Question for, uh, for you about the Theracurmin trial. When do you expect the results? Well, we're not done enrolling yet. We've enrolled 30 out of the uh, planned 50 people. Again, we, we got slowed down again by the pandemic. So we're picking up speed again. I'm hoping that we'll have this thing enrolled by maybe October. And then six months after that, we'll have results. Yeah. 
Yeah. A couple of questions, two very hot topics in the ALS community. Maybe if you can give a, a, a brief answer about both the relationship uh, between ALS and Lyme disease and also the use of stem cells. I guess, what are your views about these two topics? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I feel like I try to keep a very open mind about ideas that people have. I mean, I've, I've explored some really, really unusual ideas and I've heard over and over and over again about this you know, possible connection between Lyme and ALS. And all I can say is I've looked at it multiple times, multiple different ways with multiple different co-investigators and I cannot find a convincing connection between Lyme disease and ALS. Now, is that the same as saying it doesn't exist? No, I'm just telling you, I haven't been able to find proof of a connection between Lyme and ALS. Um, so if, if there's yeah. people out there who have different ideas about how to look for it, then, then the ones I've already published on, I'm happy to entertain those. But I've had many patients over the years you know, who went somewhere to a so-called Lyme literate clinic and got treated for Lyme disease. I, I never saw anyone get better. A couple of updates people asked um, about the regimen D predopidine. So uh, predopidine is already up and running. So please contact your clinic uh, if you're interested um, in that regimen specifically or in the platform trial. Uh, then there were questions about future regimens. So regimen E, which is um, trialose made by Silos, uh, we expect that to be added before the end of the year. And then in terms of future regimens, so one was selected, RNS60 made by Revalesi. Again, we are working working on the next steps with them uh, and more are being selected. So I think, uh, you know, um, Revalesio or others will be for uh, early 2022. Um, other questions, uh, also somebody asked about whether um, one can use Radicav or not. Again, talk to your physician that it's not contraindicated in the trial. So um, it doesn't interact with any of the trial medications. So it's completely uh, your choice to use it or not in, in collaboration with um, your doctor. Question about medical cannabis, any reversals because of that use or? So there, there have been reversals who were taking cannabis at the time that they recovered. But I would say, be careful of the word because, and this is, this is one of the hardest things for non-scientists to understand. Just because two things happened one after the other does not mean the first thing caused the second thing to happen. You know, I actually, I believe that there is promise to cannabis for ALS. I mean, we've written in ALS Untangled about this. There are a lot of mechanisms by which cannabis could improve symptoms of ALS that we don't have great treatments for. For example, it can improve pain, it can improve cramps, it can improve appetite, it can improve anxiety, it can improve insomnia. But there's also really quite good um, mechanistic and preclinical data suggesting that it could slow the progression of ALS including animal models that were positive with, with cannabinoid receptor agonists. So it's very frustrating to me that, you know, we've got such handcuffs on when it comes to trying to study cannabis. Um, I, I don't know what the best brand or form or dose or route of administration is, partly because we can't study it. I mean, it's just, we're, it's so regulated at the federal level in this country that we can't study yeah. it. Now, thankfully, in other countries, there are starting to be trials. There's a trial going on in Australia that I'm adv an advisor for, and there's a trial going on in Canada. So I think soon we will have some answers as to whether these forms of cannabis that are being studied do anything. And I think it's if we have data, I think there's a precedent for us going to Congress to say, look, we need to make some exceptions to these, these ultra strict cannabis laws for people with ALS. There already is a precedent for an exception for kids with a disease called Darvais syndrome. This is a developmental disease where kids you know, have severe seizures and cannabis seems to be the only thing that works. So in every state and federally, you can legally prescribe cannabis products to kids with Darvais syndrome, but that doesn't exist for any other disease. If we had the data in hand, I think with this powerful community, we could probably convince Congress to at least let us do some studies here in the United yeah. States. Absolutely. So we, we keep receiving a lot of questions. So I wonder whether we should break because we try to keep these uh, webinars short also for circulation and recording. Uh, we would love to have you back 
many times, please. Of course, I'm happy to come back. Yes, yes. So uh, if people didn't have their uh, question answered, please email them to Catherine so that uh, hopefully we can connect uh, by email or please let's uh, schedule uh, another time um, with Rick for him to come back and maybe we can post it online so that uh, we have another appointment with you. Lots of great questions tonight. Thank you so much. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Bye. Bye-bye.